In this video, we will look at the square of opposition. This is the second video in a series introducing symbolic logic. Consider the sentence, all swans are white. This is a categorical proposition because it expresses a relationship between two categories of things, swans and white things. This sentence also happens to be false, and I can prove it. Here's a black swan, and here's another, and here's another. These counterexamples show that the relationship doesn't hold between these two categories. In other words, not all swans are white. Knowing that this sentence is false isn't the end of the story, because it immediately tells us that another sentence is true, that some swans are not white. In fact, these two sentences are logical contradictions. If one is false, the other is necessarily true, and vice versa. Let's look at how these sentences work. In standard form, a categorical proposition will have two terms that name two categories of things. One term is called the subject, and the other is the predicate. A categorical proposition makes a claim about the relationship between these two categories. You might have learned to deal with these kinds of sentences using Venn diagrams, where you draw circles to label the different categories, and then you shade in parts if it's empty, or you put an X in if something is there. If we thought all swans are white, that means that there are no swans that are not white, so we'd shade in this part. But of course that's false, and we can express the true sentence that some swans are not white by putting an X right here, indicating that some non-white swans exist. The difference between shading this part or putting an X here is one way to demonstrate that these sentences are contradictory. These diagrams are named after a logician named John Venn, who introduced this method back in the 19th century. But to really understand the categorical propositions, you need to go back to the 4th century BC, when Aristotle first systematized logic, and he did it with a square. Aristotle described every categorical proposition as having two formal attributes. One he called the quantity, which refers to how much of a term is being considered. For Aristotle, there were two basic quantities, the universal and the particular. The universal considers the whole of a category and uses words like all or every, and the particular considers only some of the individuals in a group and uses the word some. All and some are called quantifiers because they express the quantity of the proposition. The other formal attribute is called the quality, and it describes the relation between the subject and the predicate. An affirmative quality indicates that the subject is a member of the predicate category, and a negative quality indicates that the subject is not a member. Negative qualities are indicated with the quantifier no, or the copula are not. Filling this table in gives us four distinct propositions, which will form the corners of our square. It again becomes obvious why our original two sentences are contradictions. The claim that all swans are white makes an affirmative universal claim, and so is in the top left corner, whereas some swans are not white makes a particular negative claim and shows up in the bottom right. Being on opposite corners of this chart indicates contradictory sentences, and that sets up the framework for our square. So let's start building the square. Each of the four propositions of this table are named with letters. The universal affirmative proposition is named A, and the particular is named I, from the first vowels in the Latin word affirmo. The negative proposition is named E, and its particular is named O, from the Latin word nego. These four propositions form the corners of our square, and establish the basic symmetries that we'll exploit to derive logical truths. We already know one of the relationships in this square. A and O sentences are contradictory, so we can draw a line to indicate that relation. Contradictory sentences always have opposite truth values. No matter what terms we substitute for S and P, if we know the truth value for one, we immediately know the truth value for the other. The same relationship holds between the I and E corners. If we know the truth value of an I sentence, we also know the corresponding E sentence has the opposite truth value. These are just the contradictory relationships across the middle of the square. We could have done that with the Venn diagrams. The edges of this square describe more complicated relationships that are a bit trickier, but can be just as useful. Consider the two universal sentences in the top edge of the square. A and E aren't contradictory because they don't always have opposite truth values. Sometimes A and E sentences are both false. However, if one of them is true, the other must be false. These two sentences can never be true at the same time. This is called the contrary relation, and it holds between the two universal propositions. The two particular propositions bear a similar relation, called subcontrary. It's possible that both I and O sentences are true at the same time, so again they're not contradictions. But it can never be the case that they're both false. So if you know one is false, you immediately know the other must be true. I have to pause here and put a big asterisk on all of this, because these inferences only work if the subject term actually refers to something that exists. If the subject doesn't exist, then we're not allowed to make these inferences. For instance, consider the sentence some vampires are vegetarians. This sentence is pretty clearly false, but by the subcontrary relation, that would make the corresponding O sentence true, namely that some vampires are not vegetarians. It's strange to say that this is true because vampires don't exist, so it's strange to say that anything is true of them. The point is that the square of opposition only works if we're talking about real things that actually exist and have properties. This is what led logicians in the 19th and 20th centuries, like John Venn, to look for alternative ways of systematically expressing logical relations without this existential crisis. This eventually led to the development of modern logic, and we'll talk about modern logic later in the series. But modern logic doesn't make Aristotle's system wrong or useless, it just means we have to be careful about how we apply it, by making sure the subjects of our sentences actually exist. 
The final relation in the square is along the right and left edges. Both edges share the same subalternation relation, and it works like this. If the universal is true, the particular is necessarily true. You can think of it like the truth of the universal trickling down to each of the particulars. This inference, for example, would make modern logicians uncomfortable, but it works perfectly well under the assumption that life forms exist. But you can't say the reverse. If the particular is true, the universal still might be false. Truth only trickles down. Instead, falsity grows up. If you know a claim is false in the particular case, then it must also be false in the universal case. Subalternation works the same on both sides of the square, and it's entirely compatible with the contrary and subcontrary relations. So let's just say that no one loves you. This I can immediately infer. It's false that someone loves you by the contradiction relation, and because falsity grows up with subalternation, I know that the false I sentence implies a false A sentence, so that it's also false that everyone loves you. And that's what we'd expect by the contrary relation between E and A. If the A sentence is false, that also means that the O sentence is true, so someone does not love you. Again, that's exactly what we'd expect from subalternation with E and the subcontrary relation with I. The square works. Not every sentence will generate as many logical implications. If you know it's true that someone loves you, then we also know the E sentence, no one loves you, is false because it's a contradiction. Falsity doesn't move down, so we can't say anything about the corresponding O sentence. Truth doesn't move up, so we can't say anything about the A sentence either. If you think about it for a second, you'll also see that the contrary and subcontrary relations won't help us in determining the truth value of A and O. In this case, the truth value of one sentence still leaves some of the sentences ambiguous, so the truth value can't be derived from logic alone. The only way to get good at logic is by doing logic, so I'm going to put these examples in the next slide of the Prezi and replace some of the truth values with blank spaces. The link to this Prezi is in the info box. Try using the square of opposition to fill in the blanks. In this video, we used the traditional square of opposition to test some immediate inferences. Immediate inferences are fun, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. The real beauty of categorical logic is in the relationships between three propositions, which Aristotle called a syllogism, and is really the centerpiece of his logical system. We'll look at categorical syllogisms next time.